following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The path to meditation refers to this image, which is a traditional teaching tool from Tibetan Buddhism. And it depicts a meditator who starts from zero, starts from a beginner level, and scientifically, logically, practically, step by step, moves through a progression in order to reach a state of meditation. As we explained in this course, meditation is not an idea or a theory. It is not a belief. Neither is it a practice or a behavior to imitate. Meditation properly defined is a state of consciousness. It is actually something that you, any living thing can experience because the state of meditation is the natural, unconditioned state of the consciousness itself. When the consciousness is able to perceive and understand without the influence of any trauma or desire or fear or anger or pride or lust, greed, gluttony, avarice, all of those divisive, limited view types of aggregates or samskaras or kleshas or egos or defects or sins or whatever you want to call them. Psychological conditions, you can say. When all of those veils are taken off of the consciousness, it is able to perceive reality and understand. And this is a natural capacity of every living thing in its own level because consciousness has many levels. That's what's depicted in this other image called the tree of life. So every living thing has consciousness at its level from the simplest organisms to the most sophisticated and most beautiful. So from the tiniest atoms and molecules and, and particles, even including light itself at its most basic level, has consciousness in its level all the way up till we get to the levels of angels and Buddhas and gods and all those beings that we, from our perspective, admire because of their perfection. And we want to be like that. The capacity for us to become like that is the consciousness itself. If we remove the filters that condition it and cause us to suffer, and likewise expand and grow that consciousness, we raise our level of being. And that's what meditation is for. So the state of meditation is essential for any person who's interested in developing themselves as a human being. Because it's in that state that you are able to experience what it is to actually be human. Without that experience, we're only left with all the conditioning factors that cause us to suffer. Desire, lust, anger, pride, greed, jealousy, fear. All of the qualities that we know as life that actually are not living. They are states of conditioned experience, limited experience. 
So we can remove those veils through the process of meditation, the science of meditation, experience what it means to be a real human being, and then grow and expand to become something more. And that's a scientific thing. It's not about beliefs. It is not about accepting or rejecting things, disbelieving things, except believing other things. It has nothing to do with that. This is something scientific and experiential that anyone can approach and understand through their own experience. So these two images illustrate that for us. And as we explained in the previous lectures, the process to reach the experience is in stages. So naturally, we all want to have understanding of our suffering, to understand the purpose of our life, to understand why things are the way they are. And to have that understanding is a type of wisdom that our intellect is not capable of. It's a type of wisdom that the consciousness is capable of. But for it to access that knowledge, that experience, it cannot, as long as it is perceiving through the filters of pride and anger and lust and all the other qualities that, that afflict us. So to reach that profound wisdom, which in Sanskrit is called prajna, we need to liberate the consciousness from its conditioned state. And that liberated state, when it is not conditioned, is called in Sanskrit samadhi. And that's translated here as ecstasy because it literally means the ecstasy of the consciousness when it is not conditioned by discontentment, anxiety, fear, all the other qualities that make us suffer. That state of ecstasy or liberation can be attained in a temporary sense at any time if we know the causes that produce that liberated state. And it can also be made permanent so that that state of liberation becomes our normal way of being. And that's a huge work. That's what the path of self-realization or liberation or realization is all about. It's about liberating oneself from those conditioning factors, sins in other words. So the path to reach that liberated state, that ecstasy of the soul, is through ethics, shila in Sanskrit. And that's why every scripture in the world emphasizes ethics. Do not kill, do not steal, do not lie, do not commit sexual misconduct, do not in ingest intoxicants, do not do this, do not do that, and then at the same time, adopt these positive behaviors, sacrifice for others, become humble, become pure, become like that which you want to be. Purify yourself of all your animal behaviors, your animal desires, and become something better. And simple cause and effect is what produces that liberated state of ecstasy. When all of our harmful actions have been abandoned and we adopt beneficial actions, beneficial behaviors, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally, then by simple cause and effect, we become happier and we are producing happiness around us, in our family, in our friends, in our communities. And by simple cause and effect, our consciousness is no longer afflicted by the results of our previous bad behaviors. So we start to experience that ecstasy little by little. Happiness, contentment, joy, diligence, the ability, the energy to work hard, especially on behalf of others. And that in itself starts to develop this wisdom, prajna, understanding, not only about ourselves and our own condition, but about the state of the world. So you see, there's no belief here. It's very practical. But this is the simple outline of what meditation is about. Meditation is a state of consciousness that becomes a possibility when we remove the conditions that prevent it. So this is our focus in this tradition. We are not focused on chasing a state of ecstasy. We are not focused on trying to uh, by some means, by some trick or another, by some technology or some particular practice, 
to provoke suddenly a state of ecstasy or some kind of pleasant sensation. That's a fool's errand. Instead, we're focused on removing the obstacles that prevent it from happening on its own because the state of meditation is our natural state. It exists in us, but we have obscured it because of our behaviors. So instead of focusing on chasing after an ecstasy or sensation, we focus on changing that which prevents it. And what prevents it is our behaviors, our emotions, our tendencies psychologically. So by placing attention and working on those things, changing our behaviors, changing our psychology, changing our way of being, the samadhi, the ecstasy, will come spontaneously. Just a simple cause and effect. And from that comes wisdom. The first step of those three stages, ethics, is explained in every tradition. You have the Ten Commandments, you have the Paramitas, you have the Vinaya, you have the different vows and the different uh, observances that you find in every tradition. The basic sort of don't do these harmful things and instead do these beneficial things. The results you achieve in meditation are directly proportional to how serious you take ethics. If you only consider ethics as something optional or something occasional, then your meditation will practice will proceed in exactly the same lukewarm way. It either will not develop at all or only in fits and starts intermittently and shallow. But if you take your ethics very seriously and focus yourself very intently on uncovering the secret causes of your behaviors, the secret motivations that lurk in the depths of your psychology, and you work very seriously every day to change, your meditation practice will develop correspondingly rapidly, very fast, because these two are totally dependent on each other. They're absolutely inter interdependent. You cannot separate ethics from meditation. Impossible. The reason meditation does not happen for us is because our ethics are poor. If our ethics were very strong, meditation would be easy, spontaneous, wouldn't take any effort. You'd simply sit down, relax, close your eyes, and bang, you'd be there. It'd be your natural state. In all those traditional lineages that study meditation, the beginners are always isolated from the world. They are taken from their families, from their villages and towns, from their cities. They go live in an isolated place like a monastery or a temple, a convent. And they adhere to a strict set of rules about their behavior. They do not associate with people who are drinking or smoking or sleeping around. They do not pursue money. They do not pursue fame. They do not pursue comfort. They live day in and day out, practicing prayers, mantras, all types of observances that they go through in order to focus 100% of their energy on developing themselves. In other words, they isolate themselves from all temptation. Now, in that environment, someone who focuses seriously and works hard can access the state of meditation in a reasonable amount of time because you can see that they're focused so intently on renouncing all the harmful influences that would prevent it. Then let's compare that with us in our lifestyle now and the way we live in society. There's nothing wrong with that inherently. But if you observe the, the influences that we have around us, the types of behaviors that are encouraged by our family and friends and communities, by the television, by all the actors and actresses and pop stars. None of that has anything at all to do with improving our ethics or anything at all to do with learning how to enter the state of meditation. In fact, you could say it's all the opposite. It is all focused on 
getting more money, getting more famous, getting more materialistic things, being focused entirely on our external appearance, and having absolutely no concern at all for our quality of mind, our quality of heart, our quality of being. Looked at in that simple way, you can see why the vast majority of people who want to learn how to meditate fail. This path that's illustrated here, it is proven, it works, it's scientific, it's real, it is effective. But it completely depends on how willing you are to apply it. And to apply it effectively means we have to adopt an attitude of seriousness. You see that this first figure at the bottom right of the, the, the illustration is a monk. And it's not suggesting that we have to become an actual literal monk or nun to learn to meditate. That figure represents renunciation, psychologically speaking. We have to be willing to renounce all the things that cause suffering and change. Go against the current of the world, of society, of our own mind. To go against that, to pursue something greater, to renounce the lower achievements like material success or social recognition and instead pursue a higher pursuit, something greater. If we're willing to take our ethics seriously and walk away from things that are fruitless, spiritually speaking, this path becomes a very viable possibility for us. To experience meditation becomes a tangible potential, something achievable. And again, it's directly proportional to how much we're willing to sacrifice and how hard we're willing to work. We have to train the consciousness. Right now, it is at the level of a baby or a child. It's very weak, unskilled, and untaught. So the way we teach it is we teach it how to pay attention from moment to moment, all the time. We call this process self-observation. Some traditions call it directed attention, concentration, watchfulness, mindfulness, awareness. And all these terms are becoming quite popular nowadays which is a good thing. We need the skills. Mindfulness, watchfulness, awareness is just the kindergarten. We need it, but there's a lot more to it. Consciousness is that in us which pays attention, which perceives, which can observe and receive information by what it perceives. And it can understand what it perceives. That perception is not limited to the five senses. It begins there for us because we're here in physical bodies and the physical bodies that we have depend on these five physical senses in order for us to survive. But we have more than that as senses. How do you perceive your thoughts? How do you perceive your emotions? You're able to perceive them, but not with taste, touch, hearing, sight. You sense thought and emotion with the consciousness. That is a type of perception. And that perception, in a broad sense, you can see thoughts and emotions flowing through you all the time. And it, you perceive those in the same way that you perceive images in your memory. So if you remember where you were two or three hours ago, you see these images pop up and you perceive that in the same way you perceive your thoughts and emotions with your consciousness. That is not physical. Those images are being projected, but not physically. We, no one else can see them. They don't exist physically, but they do exist. So we see here two capacities of consciousness, concentration, and imagination. In the technical terms, in Sanskrit, those are shamatha and vipassana. And usually in English, they're translated as calm abiding and insight. But I like the simpler 
explanation, concentration and imagination. Most people who go to study meditation, they go to Zen schools, they go to Buddhist schools, they go to Hindu schools, yoga schools. The vast majority of them only teach preliminary concentration practices, such as observing the breath, repeating a mantra, observing an image and concentrating on that image. Maybe it's a yantra or a statue, repeating a sacred name. These types of practices, they are fundamental, they are important, but they are preliminary. In some schools, like the tantric Buddhist schools, you also find techniques to work with imagination, where the student is taught very sophisticated visualization exercises. They have to study very deeply in advance a whole sequence of stages of imagination that they have to project in their minds with their eyes closed. So they're developing concentration and imagination at the same time. This is the approach that we will teach here. We teach in stages. We teach preliminary concentration practices, a whole variety of them. How to observe the breath, how to observe a mantra, how to focus on any particular thing. It doesn't even matter what it is. You can concentrate on anything. If you want to concentrate on a rock or a flower, you can. It's perfectly valid because it's a preliminary technique for you to train your concentration. Imagination, we also teach preliminary exercises, how to use imagination through reading scripture and visualizing what you've read, through listening to a teaching. And while you listen, using imagination to comprehend what you're studying. So for example, during lectures like this, some students will actually meditate close their eyes and be visualizing everything that's being discussed because that power of visualization is the power of the consciousness. And by studying in that way, they learn much deeper because they're utilizing the full capacity of the consciousness to study. We also use imagination in many other ways. And then ultimately the students learn to combine these two skills, concentration and imagination. And it's in the combination when both are developed and you learn to use them together, that you can access the state of meditation very easily. But it does require to be able to produce the state of meditation at will, when you want it, when you need it. This is how you do it. You develop these two natural capacities of your consciousness in harmony with each other, concentration and imagination. That's what produces the state of meditation. In different traditions, the beginners are taught about this in different ways. Unfortunately, some schools take imagination out completely. They totally sever it. And they're able to develop very strong concentration abilities. But they're not developing the full capacity of the consciousness because its ability is to perceive. And without developing visualization, imagination, they're cutting half of their abilities off. So we don't teach that way here. We teach to use the full power of the imagination and the concentration in harmony with each other. This process of the monk ascending this winding path illustrates nine fundamental stages of concentration. That doesn't mean there are only nine. There are many more. These are the nine fundamental ones, the beginning level of concentration. And these are not dogmatic. They are not theoretical. They are not a matter of belief. They are states of concentration, qualities of concentration that all of us can experience. This image was created and given to us as a way to help people like us develop our concentration without having to guess, without being in the dark, without doing it randomly, or just by chance, but to actually have a map that guides us through the process of developing very robust concentration. But for this to actually work for us, we need to be practicing. We need to be actively working to improve our concentration daily. And this has two essential efforts. The first is to be actively using our consciousness all day long, to be present, to be here and now, all the time, 
and be making the effort to be present, to be in observation consciously. And in that way, we are choosing to place our attention. When we're engaged in any type of work, any type of activity or a conversation or driving our car, we're doing it with full awareness of what we're doing. We're paying full attention to what we are doing. And that is an act of concentration. That is an act of directing attention. Now we do this already, but we don't do it with awareness. So when we sit to watch TV, we are playing, paying attention. We have our attention on the story. But we are at the same time forgetting ourselves. We become so absorbed in what we watch that we forget our body, we forget where we're sitting, we forget who we are, and we become identified with the story. We start feeling the emotions of the story, we start to feel afraid, or we cry, or we laugh, because we are so identified, forgetting ourselves. And the same is true in any other area of life. We're driving our car, we're playing the radio, we're talking on the phone, and we're thinking of something else. So we're doing many things all at once, but not really aware of any of them. Because from moment to moment, we cannot control the attention. It's constantly being pulled from one thing to another thing without our will. So we're driving the car, we're having a conversation, and we get distracted by the radio, or we get distracted by what we're thinking about, and we don't listen anymore to the conversation that we're having with the person. We lose the train of the conversation or we lose the train of what we were listening to on the radio. So we're jumping from thing to thing. That makes us very ineffective. It means we don't hear what we're talking about with others. We're not aware of what we're doing most of the time. So in meditation, practice. The first stage is to change that and to develop the ability to focus attention on one thing and sustain it with awareness of what one is doing. This is preliminary concentration. So the first phase of that, the first aspect of that effort is to be doing it all day long. Remember I mentioned how people would go into an adopted spiritual life, like as a monk or a nun, and they live that life. They live at the, the church or the temple or the monastery, and all they do is do their chores, do their studies, but all the time focusing attention, being present training themselves constantly, all day, 24 hours, to be in the moment, aware of what they're doing. And then, for some period of time, depending on what their lineage is, they also sit down, shut down all the physical senses, and place their concentration on a single thing and sustain it on that thing for the duration of that sitting. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, four hours in order to sharpen concentration, to not only make it more penetrating, but make it more consistent. That's what this image represents. How one goes from a completely wild mind, attention that cannot remain focused, to one that remains perfectly focused and unwavering, and that cannot be distracted. That's essentially what this outlines. Little steps along the way to developing absolutely perfect concentration. This is not a spiritual power. It is not a city. It is not a boon from the gods. No one can bestow this on you. You make it through training. It's the only way to acquire it, through training. Training yourself. It's a psychological training. Only you can train your consciousness to have this ability. But as I said, it doesn't have to be something done with guesswork or by figuring it out all on your own or comparing different kinds of books and sort of making your own path. You don't have to do any of that. This was taught hundreds and hundreds of years ago in a very clear and effective way by a Buddha. So it is a good, strong, reliable teaching and it's been proven effective by millions of meditators. So again, it's very reliable. This chart or this map begins 
with the first stage, which represents a monk who's beginning to make the effort to practice. And what we see here is this renunciate who's just stepping onto the path and ahead of him is an elephant and a monkey. These are symbolic. They represent qualities of our mind. The monkey represents how our animalistic mind is flighty, unpredictable, out of control, and jumps from interest to interest like a monkey. If you just pay attention to how your mind behaves, it is always chasing different desires and seems to be completely random, out of control. It's just running around, making a lot of noise. And as much as you do to try to restrain it, it seems impossible to restrain it. So many people who approach trying to understand meditation give up as soon as they see how their mind actually is. They become overwhelmed. And really all that happens there is they just lack the willpower and the knowledge to overcome it. So we're giving you the knowledge of how to do it. Once you have the knowledge of how to do it, then it's just a matter of your willpower to do it. That's all that stops you. If you have sufficient will, you can change this. Many already have, you can do it too. The monkey is that flighty, unreliable part of our psyche that's always chasing different desires and is very quick and is jumping around from thing to thing all the time. In our initial self-observation of ourselves, this is the first thing that we need to start to change. To learn to pay attention and be present in the moment and not be so flighty, not be so unreliable, not be jumping from thing to thing all the time, not to be having five or six or seven things happening all at once, but to do one thing at a time and do it with full attention and don't stop till you're done. This is a way of training ourselves. That's why you see monks, nuns, or people who take their spirituality serious, who will drive their car and play no music and just be silent. Or they'll just walk and be silent. Or they'll eat their meal and be silent. No music, no TV, nothing. They're just paying attention to what they're doing. This is one way that people apply this level of the teaching, to train that jumping monkey of a mind. Now, the monkey is drawing behind him this big elephant. The elephant in Asian symbolism represents a very powerful helper, a very powerful creature who could be of great service to us, but if not tamed, is very dangerous. So that's what the, the elephant represents here. It's that aspect of our mind that's very powerful, very big, but is out of control. It represents the whole of our psyche that is being drug along by this addiction to novelties, to new things, to desires, to sensations. This, in other words, this bottom portion represents our current psychological situation. We as a soul, as a consciousness, see the mind going crazy, running around, doing whatever it wants, and we feel despair and hopeless, and we feel like, my mind is crazy. How could I possibly change it? How can I possibly do anything to improve this situation? My mind is out of control. And those who study meditation, right when they start, this is inevitably what is experienced. One sees how wild the mind is, how powerful it is, and feels like there's no way it can be changed. It can be changed. The clue is in the hands of the monk. These tools represent the spiritual tools that we need. He has a hook and a rope. And these represent vigilance and mindfulness. Vigilance is to be always watching. To have that hook ready to grab the elephant, to control it, 
to take control of the mind. Every time it gets away from you, you hook it again and you control it. And you hook it again and you control it. And then it runs away again, it starts being bad and you hook it and you control it. What you wanna wind up doing is to use your power of vigilance and your power of mindfulness, which is the, the constant awareness, the continuity of your awareness, to little by little catch up to these animals all day long, being present, paying attention in everything that we do, using every action as practice for our meditation. When we drive, when we walk, when we eat, when we sleep, we always bring ourselves to the present moment. Relax. I can't emphasize that enough. Physical tension, emotional tension, and mental tension, we create them. And they are obstacles. So part of being a student and learning to meditate is relaxing all the time. Being present, paying attention, and relaxing. And that is a, takes effort in the beginning. But little by little, the more you learn about how your mind functions and about your different psychological behaviors, it becomes easier. All the way over on the left, we see this raging fire. That represents how much effort it takes in this first phase. It takes a lot of effort and it feels exhausting. First part is the all day long observation of oneself, being present, being mindful. The second part is the time when you actually sit to develop your concentration practice. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever that time is that you have to develop it. These two are completely interdependent. If you're only sitting to practice concentration for 10 minutes a day, but the rest of the day you're not paying attention, you're gonna get nowhere. You will give up. You will never learn to meditate. If you're only trying to develop self-observation and not trying to develop concentration, you also will be very slow in developing. You may develop some concentration just from mindfulness, but you won't develop sufficient concentration to enter the actual state of meditation. There are many traditions now, many schools, who teach mindfulness. And they teach people to be present and to be aware, but they don't teach them how to meditate. And those people develop some serenity, superficial. It's good but they cannot penetrate the depths of the mind and actually access real meditation because their concentration remains shallow. So we need both the daily effort to be present and be mindful and the daily effort to sit and actually properly develop concentration itself. As we develop that twofold process, little by little, we reach the second stage, number two up here. And here we see that the elephant and the monkey both have a little bit of white on them. The mind is starting to settle. Thoughts and feelings and, and tension in the body are starting to release. And little by little, that settling of the, the mind begins to increase. We reach the third stage and here you see the white on the elephant and the monkey is even stronger. And when we're reaching the fourth stage, you see here the third and the fourth, that the monk has the rope on the elephant. That shows that we're starting to actually become aware of the mind more consistently. We're starting to actually have some consciousness of our psychological state throughout the day. Not only during our times of meditation, but also throughout the day. We're starting to gain control. The mind's still wild. It's still leading. It's still ahead of the monk on the path. But we're starting to gain a little control. But the problem is, as soon as we see that, we start to think, oh, okay, now I'm doing it. I'm succeeding. That is where the first danger appears. And that's that little rabbit that's sitting on the top of the elephant. That rabbit represents laziness. Because as soon as we feel like, oh, now I'm doing it, we stop making so much effort. We become a little bit lazy. So what's needed there is to extend even more, to expand even more our awareness of our psyche during the day and during the times that we are practicing 
concentration. You also notice here that the, the monkey is no longer controlling the elephant. This means that at this point, we've started to have the ability to not let that monkey mind be jumping from thing to thing. These gradual changes continue into the fifth and sixth phases. But what happens here is that the monk now leads the way. That is, the consciousness now is more established. So here's the significance of this. In the first few phases, one through four, when we're sitting to concentrate, the times that we're aware of what we're doing are shorter than the times that we're distracted. Now, anyone who's meditated knows this, that you sit to concentrate, 30 seconds or a minute goes by, and you're thinking about work, and you're thinking about the bills, or you're thinking about something that happened, and that guy on TV, and this and that, and then half an hour goes by, and you realize, oh, the session's over, and I was completely distracted the whole time. So that shows that the time that you're aware is very short, and the time that you're distracted is very long. When you're getting into the fourth, fifth, and sixth phases, Gradually, they start to shift. Your time of being aware starts to get longer, and the times of being distracted get shorter. So you see, this is not complicated. You can measure your meditation practice every day simply by looking at this chart, this graphic. The more we practice, the more intently we develop the concentration and relax deeper and deeper, the further we go along on this path. Eventually, that flighty monkey disappears, and the elephant naturally follows the monk spontaneously because the mind has become tame. When the concentration is trained, the mind also becomes calm because it's no longer subjected to the chaos that we were putting it through before. We're no longer letting the attention jump from thing to thing all the time. We're no longer letting the animal mind be in charge of our experience. Instead, we are focused, we are present, we are relaxed, serene. Now all the impressions that come in, we observe them consciously. We relax, even when things are difficult. But we know how to relax and respond appropriately. And because of that, the elephant is white, meaning the mind is calm. Thoughts and emotions are serene. Attention, concentration is sharp, present, and cannot be distracted because it is completely controlled by us as a soul or as a, as a consciousness. And then in the ninth phase is when the concentration is 100% focused, sharp, unwavering. That is what's traditionally called one-pointed mind. That is dharana, concentration itself. And from this, there is much more, which is represented in, in a poetic way by these three monks at the top. Those represent additional concentration phases that you can develop. From our perspective, we understand these other concentrations, absorptions, jhanas, whatever you want to call them. They are useful. They have a place. They will inevitably be experienced by any serious practitioner, but they are not the goal. Our goal is not to find and map out and experience all these subtle states of concentration, our goal is to liberate the mind from its afflictions, to liberate the consciousness from suffering. And for that, we only need sufficient concentration to not forget what we're doing. That's enough. That underscores the urgency of our need to change. In our current era, we need to transform radically effectively, deeply. And for that, we don't really need those things. If we can reach a concentration level, at least to the point where we can sit to meditate for whatever period of time we need to meditate and not forget that we're doing it, that is sufficient. That is enough. So that when you sit to meditate for the half hour or the hour, you might have some thoughts and emotions, you might have sensations, you might have some difficulty, but you never forget what you're doing. You don't become distracted. It's at that point that you can shift gears and develop the imagination. 
When you develop those two from that point, your practice will shoot ahead very rapidly. If you remain just focused on developing concentration, that's fine. But we prefer to shift over and rapidly develop to actually acquire understanding, to actually develop the ability to comprehend why we suffer and how we can change it. This whole outline that I gave you is all based on cause and effect. To develop concentration and subsequently enter real meditation has nothing to do with beliefs or theories or dogmas. It is completely produced by cause and effect. So if you really want to learn to meditate, study your concentration abilities. How consistently can you concentrate? Can you pay attention? For what length of time? What is the difference between the amount of time that you can pay attention without being distracted to the amount of time that you are distracted? That comparison will immediately show you where in these nine stages you are currently working. The effects of our actions are greater than the cause. We studied this in the previous lecture. If we're making some effort in our practice, but we're not making the progress that we want, we need to study our behavior. Effects are greater than the causes. When you produce an action, it reverberates out in every direction, physically, emotionally, mentally. Meaning that when I speak a word, not only do I hear it, but anyone in hearing distance hears it, which shows that if I'm alone, the effect of that word is limited. But if I'm in a crowd, that word can be very powerful. That's what that means. Effects are greater than the causes. If our current experience is not satisfactory, we need to study what causes are producing that. And similarly, what causes can produce the effects that we want. If we want to enter meditation, we need to produce the causes that create those effects. So this is a matter of looking at the proportions of our behaviors in our lives. You can't receive a consequence without committing its corresponding action. This applies to our meditation practice. You cannot enter the state of meditation if your mind is conditioned by anger, pride, lust, greed, gluttony, etc. If you're identified with a desire, that means you are encaged in it, trapped in it, limited by it. Sometimes people say, well, I'm meditating every day, but I'm so frustrated. And they don't realize that the frustration is the obstacle. It is precisely why they can't meditate, because they are frustrated. Frustration is anger. And frustration is a desire that's not being fulfilled. By facing that, recognizing that, one can change it. So if we want certain consequences, if we want to enter meditation, we want to experience meditation, we will never experience it if we don't produce the actions that lead to it. And fourth, once an action is performed, the consequence cannot be erased. Now this is a very powerful aspect of cause and effect. If you practice diligently, seriously, you produce actions they change you. They affect you. They change your mind stream. They change the course of your life permanently. So this applies to both good things that we do and bad things that we do, beneficial things and harmful things. So consider that when you're working in this process. You will face temptations. You're trying to learn to meditate. You're trying to change yourself, but then you get this opportunity to go do something that you know is harmful. So you face the temptation. And most people say, well, maybe just this once, maybe just tonight, I'll go out and I'll go with my friends and do this and that. You have to remember that once you perform an action, the consequence cannot be erased. So we see people who wanna study meditation and they practice so hard for weeks and months, but then they go on a binge, you know, sleeping around, drinking, smoking, doing all these things. They return that mind back to its wild state. That's how our life is a chaos. So we have so many competing actions, some good, some harmful. 
If we want to fundamentally change our experience, we have to choose beneficial actions that produce the consequences that we need. So the clue to that is the fifth aspect, which is that a superior law always overcomes an inferior one. A superior action, a superior behavior can overcome the ones that were misguided. This is simple ethics based in physics. It's based in how nature works. So yeah, we make mistakes, everyone does, but we can change and choose to behave better. And by choosing superior ways of behaving from moment to moment, we change the whole trajectory of our experience. If we take a serious attitude like this monk, and we take that psychological approach to think that way, to behave that way, to feel that way as a serious renunciate, and from moment to moment and experience to experience, we choose to adopt superior behaviors. Okay, so our friends are gonna go out and get drunk. So what? That doesn't mean we have to go. But we're choosing a superior way of behaving. And because of that, our life will change. And the more superior the action, the more superior the result. Simple, logical. In synthesis, if we take it seriously to pay attention from moment to moment every day, and every day to take some time to actually sit and develop our concentration, make that a serious endeavor and make it consistent every day, we will see dramatic changes inside of us. And little by little, that will extend into our environment. The course of our life will change. Our environment will change, our friends will change, our circumstances will change because we ourselves have changed integrally, psychologically. So for the students who are following this course and wanna take on the, the exercises, that's what they are. Develop your self-observation every day and develop meditative concentration every day. So for the meditative concentration part, you can adopt any number of objects of concentration. You can observe the breath as it naturally occurs in your nostrils. So you adopt a meditation attitude and posture. You relax completely. You shut off everything else. You don't pay attention to the environment you're in. You let your body rest. So you extract attention from all of your senses, except right in your nostrils. And you pay attention watching the natural flow of the breath and the sensations that produces without changing anything. You don't wanna change how the breath flows. You don't wanna change anything that's happening in your environment. Somebody's talking next door, so what? You hear dog barking, so what? you hear some other noise or you feel some pain in your body, you don't react. You don't respond to anything. You just observe. You have to take away attention from everything else because your wild mind is gonna want you to scratch those itches and adjust your posture and complain about it's too cold, it's too hot, I'm itchy, I'm uncomfortable, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, all kinds of things. My back hurts, my knee hurts. You'll be crying to yourself about so many things. That is the animal mind. And if you want to train it, you have to fix attention on this one thing and leave it there until the session is done. If you're a complete beginner, do this for 10 minutes and then take a break. Don't watch the clock. Set a timer that you don't have to watch and pay attention to. You set a timer. You close your eyes, you relax completely, and you focus your attention on that one thing, the breath in the nostrils, and you keep it there. And every time you get distracted, you return again to paying attention to the sensation of the breath as it is without modifying it. And see if you can go 10 minutes without being distracted by anything by and keeping a continual observation of those sensations. If you can do 10 minutes, then go to 20, then go to 30, then go to 40, then go to 50, then go to an hour. That's all there is to it. 
And then thirdly, I'm suggesting that the students continue with the diary. And that's something we gave in the previous lecture. So continue with that. It will help you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,